Last week I told a story about taking the wrong trail on a backpacking trip and ending up in what could have been serious trouble. I should have known better. I should have turned back sooner, but I didn't, and one of the reasons I didn't was that I didn't want to admit I was wrong. Thought about it since then and realized that if I'd had a GPS, this never would have happened because my GPS has no trouble admitting that I'm wrong. <laughs> her name is Shania, and I inherited her from my daughter, Ellie. Most of the time, she just sits there glued to my windshield, but if I miss a turn, she clears her throat and says, recalculating. <laughs> You've heard that before, haven't you, from your own global positioning system that helps you get where you're going most of the time, but when you make a mistake, when you miss a turn, she lets you know you've done it. She's very gentle about it. You know, she doesn't say, Jim, you idiot. How could you have done that? I've been telling you for the last 10 miles that turn was coming. There it was. You missed it. No, she simply says, in that delightful voice of hers, recalculating. It's her way of saying, Jim, you were wrong. She doesn't have any trouble admitting it, but I do, and I have a feeling I'm not the only one. Why is it that so many of us have trouble admitting that we are sometimes, perhaps even frequently, wrong? I have a theory. Somewhere on my shelves there is probably still a book called Coping With Your Anger by Andy Lester in which there is a diagram that shows what makes us angry. It has a big circle representing the self, and then an arrow coming toward the circle that represents a threat. When we feel threatened, Dr. Lester says, we become anxious and try to decide whether we should fight or flee. But somewhere else I learned there's a difference between the real self and the ideal self we construct in our heads. See, my ideal self would never take the wrong trail on a hiking trip, but my real self did, apparently. And the reason that it was hard for me to admit it was that my ideal self was under attack. It was threatened by this very suggestion that it could be wrong. It became anxious and prepared itself to either fight or flee. But eventually the facts stacked up against it, overwhelmed it, and allowed my real self to admit I was wrong. You see, my real self doesn't have any trouble admitting that it was wrong. It does it all the time, shrugs its shoulders and says, oops, did it again. Maybe I need my ideal self to hold my real self to a higher standard, but more often than not, it's the ideal self that is the problem. It's that critical voice I hear when I look in the mirror first thing in the morning and don't see my ideal self looking back. It's that voice I hear in my head when I don't perform as well in the Monument Avenue 10K as I thought I should. That voice I hear when I do the things I shouldn't do or don't do the things I should, my ideal self saying, shame on you. You can do better. You should have. But Jesus once said that if we want to follow him, we have to deny the self. And I think it may have been the ideal self he had in mind. Maybe he knew that it can become a kind of idol one that is never satisfied with our performance, one that makes more and more demands on us as time goes by. And if that's true for you, you should knock that idol off the shelf. Watch it shatter in a million pieces on the floor. One of the ways to do that is to stop listening to it. Stop getting angry when you look in the mirror and don't find your ideal self looking back. We are real, after all. We are humans, aren't we? Fallible, frail, feeble, 
the sooner we make peace with that reality, the better things are going to be. I still remember the girl who said, you know how some people, when they trip, take a few quick steps as if they just decided to break into a run? <laughs> yes, I said. Well, she said, I have a friend who doesn't do that. When she trips on the sidewalk, she says, look at me. What a klutz. I tripped over my own feet. And we have a good laugh, and we go on. We have a good laugh, and we go on. That's what you can do when you accept the real you. But when you are constantly trying to defend the ideal you, there is not a lot of laughter. It is deadly serious business, and it leaves God out completely. Because if you are perfect, then you don't need God. Can you see how all of this is connected to sin? In the Garden of Eden, the serpent told the woman she wouldn't die if she ate the forbidden fruit. She would become like God. That's all the ideal self really wants, is to be like God. It's practically the definition of sin. But the more we pursue that goal, the more lost we become. The further we stumble down the path to perdition. We have to stop at some point and admit, I was wrong. Or as my GPS likes to say, recalculating. I don't want to downplay the seriousness of this. Some of you are dealing with situations right now and you're not really sure how you got into them and you aren't really sure how you will get out of them, but they are serious. I talked with a man recently who admitted, and these were his own words, that he was in a hell of his own making. Counseled with a woman who told me that she buries her face in her pillow at night and sobs because she doesn't want to wake up her neighbors in the apartment next door. I heard a story about a young man who had too much to drink, got into his parents' car, went speeding down a county highway and wrapped that car around a tree. When the paramedics pulled him out, his GPS was still saying, recalculating, recalculating, without any hint of judgment, because it isn't the GPS's job to judge. Its job is to get us where we're trying to go. I've wondered this week if that's God's job as well. And when I look at this passage from Romans chapter 5, I begin to think, maybe it is. If you heard what Lisa was saying earlier, Paul says when we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we were weak, He died for the ungodly. When, when we were enemies, God reconciled us to Himself through the death of His Son. In other words, Paul is saying, this is what God does with miserable sinners when they're at their worst. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't condemn them. He dies for them in order to redeem them, which suggests that he still sees something in them that is worth redeeming. In this Lenten season, I've been talking to you about the different words for sin in the Bible. One of them is sin itself, which means something like missing the mark. One is iniquity, which is actively sinning against God. And one is transgression, which is open rebellion against God. If you have ears to hear it, all three of those meanings are present in today's passage from Romans 5. Paul says, when we were weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That is, we weren't trying to go astray. We just did. We were weak. We couldn't help ourselves. He says, God proves His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, which suggests active sinning, iniquity. In verse 10, he says, If while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life. Enemies of God are those who are in open rebellion against Him. But Paul says whether we are openly rebelling or actively sinning or passively going astray, this is the way God responds. By giving His Son, 
who comes and pulls us from the wreckage, sets us on our feet again, and points us in the right direction. That is, God still sees something in us worth redeeming, even at our worst. His job is not to condemn us forever, but to give us another chance. Recalculating, God says. Recalculating your whole life, seeing if there is some way to save you yet. Sometimes what that means for us is turning around completely. And that is one of the New Testament words for repentance. To turn around. It happens sometimes when I'm out driving, even with my GPS. I got onto an interstate in New Jersey a couple of weeks ago, missed a turn, and the GPS said, listen, there's no easy fix for this. I'm recalculating, but you're going to have to drive about five miles, take the exit, make a U-turn, come back up, and drive five miles back so that you can correct the problem. Sometimes it's like that. There is no way for us to get back to where we need to be except to do a U-turn. But there are other times when my GPS is able to recalculate in a much less dramatic way. You missed that right turn, she says. Why don't you take the next one? We'll get you back on the road where you're going. I was thinking about that when I looked at this passage about the Samaritan woman at the well. One of my colleagues pointed out to me, we often think of this woman as a sinner, Jesus says later in this passage, you've had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not your husband. What a sinner, we say, but we don't know the circumstances of her situation. Maybe all five of her husbands before had died. And maybe she didn't want to marry this one because she was afraid the same thing would happen to him. There are stranger stories in the Bible. There really are. But there she is having married all these husbands, living now with this man, she cannot really go all the way back to go again. As my colleague pointed out, she cannot unmarry those five husbands. No, she can't. And Jesus knows that. But notice what he says to her as soon as he meets her. Give me something to drink. Why should I, woman of Samaria, give you, a Jew, something to drink? Why are you even talking to me? And Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew who it was talking to you, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Knowing what he knows about her already, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me and I would give it to you because it is not God's intention to judge us or condemn us, but to save us to set us on our feet again, to point us in the right direction. And in this case, Jesus seems to give the woman a way to get back on the right path without going all the way back to go. When she leaves that well, she leaves her water jar. And some commentators believe it's because her thirst has been quenched at last. She has had a taste of living water. And she says to the townspeople, is it possible that this is the Messiah. God doesn't want to judge us or condemn us. God wants to save us. But sometimes it means precisely this, that we have to say it out loud. I was wrong. I was heading in the wrong direction. I have to stop and turn around and head back toward home again. And somebody has to help us get there. One of the things I love about my GPS, Shania, is that right there in the middle of the screen, there is a button called Home. And it doesn't matter where I am in the world, I can push that button. And Shania gets in touch with all those satellites that are whirling around in the upper atmosphere. She triangulates our position, plots the coordinates, and then in her gentle mechanical voice, she begins to tell me how to go home. I love that about her. I love this about God, that it has always been His plan to bring us home again. 
and to help us get there. Paul says it like this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to us to pull us from the wreckage, to set us on our feet, to point us in the direction that leads home. Maybe the most hopeful word you could hear on a day like this one is this word that God would speak to you about your life. Recalculating. I am recalculating to see how I can get you home. Shall we pray? Gracious God, how glad we are that you don't want to judge us or condemn us. You simply want to bring us home. And you've sent your son Jesus to show us the way. Don't make us so stubborn that we can't admit we are wrong. Help us to say it now. To say it in a way you can hear it. We are wrong, Lord, often wrong. And we need your help in getting right again. If we need to turn around completely, help us do that. If we need to take a turn to the right or the left to get back on the right track, help us do that. Whatever we need, Lord, show us so that we can get on the right path again and head our lives in your direction. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.